important link in that we hear from God. We're starting in uh, chapter 38 and the Lord is going to throw in his opinion after we have learned opinions from last week was Elihu, the young counselor of Job's, and then the three previous counselors, comforters, Job's friends. I call them the three stooges because they were really off in their doctrine. They assumed that Job's problems were the net result of Job sinning and Job had done something wrong. Which, by the way, it's not hard to point out things that people do wrong. Everybody does wrong things, right? And if you think that you only do right things, then that's wrong. So uh, anyway, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they threw in their opinions. Elihu threw in his opinions. And intermixed in the whole thing, Job was throwing in his opinions. They were trying to make sense out of the suffering and the trial that Job had been going through. We learned of this trial and, and uh, trouble back in chapter one and two, and it's probably good for us to recap, knowing that we're gonna hear from God. Um, Isaac led us in a worship song. I, I don't recognize it. He said, um, your will, your way. Did you see that as we were singing? Your will, your way. The book of Job is arguably something that's in conflict with that phrase, your will, your way, because what happened, God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God, turning away from evil. And Satan said, does Job fear God for nothing? And then he did this little argument where he said, touch what he has, surely he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't put forth your hand on him. And of course, that was chapter one. Chapter two, go ahead, give him boils. <laughs> I don't like this whole dilemma that Job was going through. How about you? But I'm glad this book is here. We learned such tremendous lessons, especially with lyrics like your will, your way. When you can see that God is in charge of what's going on, but he allows chaos. I don't like chaos. I don't like pain. You know, Isaac welcomed us all. Welcome to Calvary Lake Stevens. It's so great for you to be here. I like being here because we're inside where the air conditioning is on and we're reasonably comfortable in the Mediterranean salad was wonderful and I'm poised, ready to eat it when I get home. I have it in a little container. I don't like to eat before I talk. Kind of hawk up a loogie here. Anyway, God is going to give his opinion about this whole business. And we know from the get-go God's opinion was this trial is going to be a way to clarify that Job is an upright guy and he's with me and he's not in it for protection's sake or prosperity's sake. 
or you know anything you could come up with. He's in it for love. Next week, we're going to do the very last chapter in Job, chapter 42, where Job becomes the intercessor. This is really one of the great highlights in this whole story. He ends up praying for the three stooges. <laughs> I asked my uh, noon Bible study guys today, because we were doing uh, John chapter 18, where you have the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, and then the denial of Jesus by Peter. John chapter 18. And I asked the group, have you ever had somebody betray you or deny, take actions against you? No, I don't know him. Yeah, he's good for nothing, you know, kind of thing. And the reason why I asked that question is because all of us have feelings of being let down by someone or some situation. Look at Job. He, he lost his family. He lost his children. It's, it was a horrible trial, just terrible. And behind it all, underneath it all, was God, if I can put it in my terms, bragging to the devil that Job was such a good guy. Go ahead, give him your best shot. Let's see what you can come up with. I know that sounds kind of degrading to God that he was using Job as a guinea pig, but here's the truth. Some of us have gone through trouble where you feel like you're a guinea pig and people are just watching you. Have you ever felt that way? I have. I remember going through the worst trial of my life and I said, God, why me? And the Lord spoke to me clearly. He said, why not you? People go through trouble. We're gonna let you be an example for everybody who goes through trouble. And I thought, great. <laughs> but to be a Christian, a believer, a follower of Christ, you have to realize sometimes God's got a, you know, he's got a different program going on besides um, I wanna have an easier life or you know, <laughs> I'm, do you, I don't know if you guys know this, I'm at retirement time in my life. And like I used to lead the church, now I just kind of hang out. And Shane does all the leading and he has all the trouble, which is great, I love that. And I don't have responsibilities like I used to. I just cherry pick and do a little here, a little there. And it's fun. I'm, I'm relaxing. And it's not like I want to say, you know, I deserve to relax. But don't every once in a while you think to yourself, I'd like to relax a little bit. Dads, Father's Day is coming. Think of all the tools you need or some presents that you'd like and throw a pitch, you know, your kids ought to respond. Anyway, I'm rambling. I just want to say, God, as he speaks for himself, I don't think he's gonna make Job all that happy. And if we apply this learning to ourselves, we're not gonna be real happy with God sometimes. But remember this of all things. He has, by his promise, plans for us for eternity. We're gonna be with him for eternity after we run this race that we're in here on earth and we get to the finish line, which is death, unless the rapture happens, which would be great, right? I'd love to do that. That'd be the best amusement park ride ever. Um, but I, I think we're gonna have eons and eons, ages and ages to kick back and not be so 
you know, under such stress in our life. Do you guys get stressed when it comes to getting up and getting your business going, getting your job going, and making all your ends meet? Hey, the Lord's got plans. And, and let me say this too. And it was in our songs tonight. The Lord loves us. He completely loves us. One of the greatest pieces of New Testament doctrines, for God so loved the world. He just loves us. And he wants Jesus when he prayed in John 17, that they might be with me. Jesus wants us to be with us, with him for eternity. It's just wonderful. And so I see God's love for Job in this. However, we're at Job 38, when the Lord begins to speak. And so the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, by the way, um, Elihu had kind of set God up for a response. God is springboarding on the lesson that Elihu had thrown, thrown out there that um, nature and uh, the things that people see in creation speak of God's glory. And so God is going to use nature to speak of his glory to Job. And he answered and said out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? And he starts up in this cryptic kind of response, not given any reasons to Job for all his questions or um, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, or Elihu. He doesn't clarify what was on his mind. He just does this abstract thing. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Or verse eight, enclose the sea with doors. And everybody has studied um, the oceans with its ebb and flow, the you know pull of the moon's gravity on the earth, and and there is an order to the ocean. That's why they're so worried about you know global warming and the melting of the ice caps, and there's not going to be enough room for the water, and it's going to overflow. Seattle will go into the water. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Baptize those guys. <laughs> Verse 12, have you ever commanded life and commanded the morning? And he talks about the rhythm of night and day. Verse 16, have you ever entered into the springs of the sea? Have you ever been in a place in the ocean where there's fresh water and salt water mixed together? It's the weirdest thing ever. And yet it's all over the place. From artesian water coming out. Springs, even in the ocean. Fresh water stuff. Or verse 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light in darkness? He talks about that in the natural world. Verse 25, who has a cleft in a channel for flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain onto a land without people? It's just talking about nature, I guess. And verse 30 says, water becomes hard like stone. Where is that? That's all over in the polar caps, right? Icebergs. Water that's hard as stone. Verse 31, he talks about the host of heaven. Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season? Guide the bear with its sound? Can you imagine God talking about these things? 
He's bringing them up in a rhetorical sense so that these wise fellows can think to themselves, wow, I guess you are kind of orderly. Verse 34, can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water may cover you? No, just move to the northwest. Verse 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion? And it talks about the natural world. Lions have it in them, right? To hunt and conquer. Verse chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know the time of the mountain goats to give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? I love these examples. Unless you're someone who has an interest in nature, or maybe you're a hunter and you go out and see these things, you don't really take notice of how there's order going on and God had designed it. Verse five, who set out the wild donkey free? God uses the example of a wild donkey to explain himself to Job. Because Job had said, what are you doing, God? You've, you've wounded me without cause. And God said to him, yeah, what about a wild donkey? Is that good enough for you, Job? He's probably thinking, what kind of an explanation is this? And he talks about these animals. <laughs> Look at verse 13. The ostrich's wings flap joyously. They don't even use their wings. They run. <laughs> verse 19. Do you give the horse his might? Horses have always been a source of great power on the earth. Verse 26. Is it by your understanding that a hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Don't you just love to watch the birds of prey? Over in our neck of the woods, we live on Radar Heights, and it's up above the, the lake, and the eagles fly there. Because they go down, they dip in, grab the... But you know what? The crows chase the eagles. Have you ever seen that? They pester them. And I, w I love to watch him fight. All the eagle does, he says, oh, okay, I'll come back for the fish later. And he soars, it just takes off, leaves him in the dust. <laughs> it's fun to watch nature. Then God begins to up the ante. He starts to challenge Job. Chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. And then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to thee? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer. Even twice I will not add. I will add no more. Huh, finally, he starts getting smart. Have you ever had to lay your hand on your mouth and say, don't talk, don't talk? So the more you talk, the more trouble you get into. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, verse 7, gird up your loins like a man, and I'll ask you, and you instruct me. Oh, boy. <sighs> At this point, you know Job's in big trouble. He uses this phrase, gird up your loins like a man. Look back in chapter 38, verse 3. Gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. God said this twice. What is it that God is after? I want to uh, work this a little bit. First of all, are men more important 
Do men conquer, gird up your loins like a man? Is it, I want to be like a man kind of thing? Um, you know, half the world is men. There's a lot of women. And you ladies need to know that you can act like a man. In this case, here's, here's what I think God is saying. And I got the microphone and I'm going to tell you what I think God said. Here's what I think God was saying. Uh, let me illustrate. Years ago, I taught Andrea uh, principles of playing ball. She wanted to play softball. and So we worked on a lot of different things, but a lot of softball or baseball is throwing and catching. So we would go out in the front yard and throw and catch. And I can't tell you how many throws and catches we've done. It's probably in the tens of thousands that we've done over time. And she, I remember when it was first going on, she said, Dad, what are you trying to make me like a boy? And this is what I said. I'm going to make you like a ball player. You're certainly not going to throw like a girl or a wimpy boy. You're going to throw like a ball player because ball players throw hard and they hit their target. I remember um, I, we worked on this so much and I, I taught her, throw the ball right at my face. Don't make me go one side or the other. I want to right at my face. Uh, picture a, uh, there's a drawing of my face on the softball and throw and hit me right in the kisser. And she said, I don't want to do that. And I said, yeah, you need to do that. And so she started throwing it. It was coming to my face and I'd throw it right back to her face. And before you know it, we were throwing pretty hard back and forth to each other. And I bought her this Nokona glove that has a real nice snap to it. And I'd throw it hard and, and she'd catch it just before it hit her face. And it'd snap. I said, oh, that sounds good. Hit me right in the face. Come on. And we'd go back and forth. And then eventually, I took her to the field. She was playing catcher, so I put her behind the plate. And I'd go out to second base. And I'd say, now this is where I want you to throw down. Throw right here. And pretty soon she had it to where it was the tag was on. I didn't even have to move my glove. And I would throw to her so that she wouldn't have to move her glove for a, a runner coming to home. And we did that back and forth. And, and I took her to the field. I said, we're going to throw 100. And she said, oh, I don't want to throw 100. And we'd throw. She would be crying. And I would force her to throw like a ball player. And you know what? Nobody is more proud of her than me. <laughs> she is a dream come true for a girl ball player. Gird up your loins and throw like a ball player. I think that's what God is saying. Come on, you guys, you think you're smart? You think you know the game? Let's see what you got. Now, you might think I'm off, but that's okay. I think God was pushing Job to be a player. He finally got the picture. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Will you really annul my judgment? Verse 8. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Here's the great lesson of the book of Job. When you don't understand what's going on and you decide that God is not being righteous and fair to you, be careful. You might end up accusing Job or accusing God of, you know, having something unrighteous in him. And he's not unrighteous. God challenges Job. Do you have an arm like God? Can you throw down a second like this? 
Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and, and all this wonderful thing. Then um, he kind of finishes up with some real fanciful explanations. Verse 15, he talks about behemoth. Behemoth. Some of your versions have a different word. What is it? Hippopotamus. One time my grandson came up to me and said, Grandpa, you're as big as a hippo. And then he hit my tummy. Why? Because hippos are giant. And they're powerful. And they run fast. And their mouth is... You can crush you. They think this behemoth is a sighting of a dinosaur. The book of Job is one of the earliest books written. In fact, a lot of Bible scholars believe it was the first book written. And it's recording an ancient observation of things on the earth. And you guys know dinosaurs used to be around. Behemoth. Verse 7, 17. He bends his tail like a cedar. His tail was, tail was like a tree. Then he jumps to chapter 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Leviathan. He talks about a sea monster. This sea dragon. He, he gives him dragon-like scales and description coming up out of the sea and then he even he gives this description of a leviathan verse 19 out of his mouth go burning torches sparks of fire leap forth out of his nostrils smoke goes forth like a burning pot and burning rushes what what do you think of when you read this? You think of smog from the the lion or the yeah the hobby. You know the it's it's what it, we would categorize as fantasy, something that's not true. Hey, this is in God's word, and God said this. God described this creature. Was there dragons, sea dragons? Yes. Was there dinosaurs? Yes. There were. God talked about them when he was going back and forth with Job. And when they have these archeological digs where they find shapes of skeletons that look like these creatures, all you can think about is the book of Job. God told a story about what these creatures look like. And he used it in a rhetorical fashion to tell Job, where were you when I made these things? Come on, Mr. Smart Guy. Gird up your loins and, and see if you can give me an answer here. And let me tell you, nobody knows the answer to where the dinosaurs went, where they lived, where they went, or the sea monsters, or the dragons. Where did they go? We can ask God when we get to heaven. He's probably got an instant replay up there where we can see it all. But it's, it makes for good, you know, screenwriting and stories that they sell in the movies. It comes right here, right out of God's word. When God was talking to Job. Now, I'm going to finish tonight with 
Um, chapter 42, I want to save for next week. Um, you guys go and look at it. And I, I want to cherry pick through the book of Job some of the really great things that Job said. I'm going to have like a list so that we can make notations in our Bibles or highlights on your tablets or whatever. But I want to finish with this. Turn over to Romans chapter 9. You may not like this part of my lesson today, but that's okay. This is what I believe. And Isaac led us in song about it tonight. His will, his way. God is to be reckoned with. Every one of us has to have a conversation with God, maybe like Job had. I don't know if you've ever felt alive and sassy enough to tell God, give God a piece of your mind. I have. And the Lord, he tends to be kind of cryptic sometimes when you're trying to box him in a corner. Lord, why, why are you letting this happen to me? I'm, I'm busy. I'm doing your work. I'm a pastor. I don't need this added stress. I remember the Lord having a talk with me saying, so you're a pastor, right? And you're teaching people God's word and, and you're teaching people about me and, and how I work here on the earth. So uh, what's wrong with me letting you have a little bit of fire and trial so that everybody can watch you as you put into practice the things you're trying to teach. And I remember saying, Lord, that's not the way I want to teach. <laughs> I would like to teach in maybe a little more of a clinical way or, you know, maybe an academic sort of way or something that, you know, lacks personal involvement. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, because the ministry is kind of hard, and I was, you'll probably think this sometime, the ministry is really great if it wasn't for people. <laughs> you can get real theoretical and ideological about these things, but there's nothing better than an example for people to look at. Have you ever heard of a, what do they call that when people are looking at a wreck and they're driving down the road and they're rubbernecking because they want to see what the wreck was like. I remember one time a guy went zooming past me, just flying. He was speeding and I was thinking, man, where's the cops when you need them? And a few miles down the road, he had rolled his car over and he was down in the ditch. And already the cops had showed up and they were taking care of him. And I said, where are the cops when you need them? <laughs> They're at the place of your wreck. Trying to help you out. Because you're a wreck. Anyway, Romans 9. Here's, here's an example of God's sovereignty. The way he arranges things, his will his way. It's a discussion that Paul had with the Romans as he's writing to them, talking about how God arranges things. He said, verse 7, um, neither are they God's children um, because they're Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Abraham had a descendant called Ishmael. Remember? Ishmael was the father of the Arab nations. Isaac, Abraham had Isaac, who later gave birth to Jacob, who was renamed Israel. Israel and the Arab nations have been at war forever troubled and they're all sons of Abraham 
neither are they um, Abraham's descendants because through Isaac your descendants will be named. Isaac gave birth to Judah who uh, Jacob renamed Israel and gave birth to Judah who was um, forerunner, forefather of Jesus. We're all sons of Jesus. And then he tells the story about Jacob and his brother Esau. And the twins, it says, verse 11. How many of you are twins? We have twins in our family. And you can't say one is better than the other. They're very unique, very different. Mark, you're a twin. You and your brother are as different as night and day. And you're much better, right? <laughs> You've been listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> Though the twins were not yet born and hadn't done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. For God said, the younger will serve the older. No, the older will serve the younger, sorry. Just as, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. That's one of those scriptures that you're thinking, why is that there? It's like the book of Job, why is that there? It's for us to understand his will, his way. God has plans for us, and we might not like it sometimes. Then I want to read all these verses starting in 14. What shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth and so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. That phrase right there is why we've got the book of Job. He intended to have mercy on Job even though Job had to go through the ringer, the old ringer watcher things where they, he was on spin cycle his whole life, getting wrung out. But God was going to give him mercy. He hardens those whom he hardens for his own desires. Some people have trouble and it's never resolved and actually it leads them to more trouble and they become bitter and in their bitterness, they actually make more decisions that are gonna lead them into you know, greater tragedy in their life. That's the reason why next week I wanna talk about Job's success. He had success in the way he viewed God. If I had to live under a theological premise like the three stooges was given to Job, I would hate that. If God was just gonna be mean to me just because he decided he was gonna be mean. Because all of the things that Job experienced, that was mean, harsh, sorrowful. He needed comfort. And instead he got these guys saying, Job, you sinned. And because of that, all this trouble's come your way. And that's not the reason why the trouble came his way. We read the first couple of chapters. There was a backstory to the whole thing. It was a spiritual battle. And we learned from the book of Job that spiritual battles are real. They're real. And the enemy of your soul wants to steal and kill and destroy you. 
And if he can use a natural setting of some sort to throw you off and hurt you, I gave you an example about how I taught my daughter to throw at her face. Remember that? Well, one time she was warming up a pitcher and this pitcher was not paying attention. And she threw the ball to Andrea when we, her glove wasn't out there. The ball hit her right in the face. And I was really close by and I ran out on the field and I, I said, honey, and while I was looking at her face, this big, huge thing grew. And we, I took her to the walk-in right away and they took a picture and they talked about how the orbital bone could have been broken and sliced her uh, things connected to her eye and she would have been blind. And I was thinking to myself, I taught her how to throw it at your face. You gotta protect your face when you're out there with a bunch of crazy ball players. In the game of life, we experience trouble. We'll have some trouble. Only God can sort it through. If you get to where you're really pushy with God and you're telling him you have done a bad job on this. I don't like the way you've done this. Get ready. He's gonna say, okay, gird up your loins. We're gonna have a chat. And in this chat, you're gonna to explain to me what it's like to have a fire-breathing sea dragon come out and burp on you. Only God knows how that whole thing happened. And in our lives, only God knows he can make sense out of it. First of all, I'd say, cover your mouth. Don't let word, too many words come out. You can have a few, you can tell your wife, she'll forgive you. Um, <laughs> I remember when my son Jody was dying of cancer and she was reading this book about how cancer comes and so she started throwing ideas out maybe it was because of this or maybe it was because of that and I said no it's not any of those things and she was so mad at me because I wouldn't listen to her I, I was listening when I was just saying it came from the mother earth catalog you ever read that thing it's, it's something for desperate people I think but it's this big, huge book. And we were laying in bed when she was giving me the story and, and I was giving her the na, na, na. And she grabbed that book and hit me right on the head. <laughs> Remember that? Why did she do that? Because she had agony and she had sorrow. And she, she was having a crummy life. That was crummy, wasn't it? Every once in a while you have a crummy life. And you're looking for reasons so that you can figure it out. Only God can figure it out. So cover your mouth, let him comfort you. Take comfort in the idea Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For I go and prepare a place for you that afterwards I will come and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Father, thank you for your great love for us that you sent us Jesus to come and accomplish redemption and salvation. Thank you for this wonderful good news and we embrace it fully and we believe in you totally. And we pray that you would help us to make sense out of troubles that we have. And may we be equipped to be good counselors and comforters to people and not just um, people who make things worse. 
We'd like to be used by you, Lord, to bring comfort to our brothers and sisters. Thank you for letting us be in the game. Send us off with your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll finish up next week.